Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure, as one of the two chief adjudicators for next year's World Championships, to welcome you to this grand final of the regional mini World's Championships being held here in Qatar in 2009. Tonight is the end of a long road for the teams who have taken part in the last week. And before I tell you the debate motion and the two teams, I'd like to do three very quick things. The first is that I think we should first of all acknowledge the contribution made by the trainers and the members of the faculty who have put in so much work in the course of the last week. The second is to acknowledge the work done by all of you, the team members, who have worked so hard and who have done so well and who have improved so much in the course of the last week. And the third is to acknowledge in particular two sets of people, and in no special order, they are Professor Snyder, who is trying to take a photograph of me, who is the front person and major organiser of all of this, and most of all, we need to thank Qatar Debate. What an amazing organisation Qatar Debate is, and it's only two years old. Imagine what it will be like when it's 10 or 20 years old, what an amazing organisation it's going to become, and what an amazing influence it will become in this country. So congratulations and thank you to all of the people involved from Qatar Debate. So to the grand final. Tonight, we have a debate between the team from New Zealand, who will be proposing, they're on my right. And their first speaker is James Penn, second speaker, Nicholas Orr, third speaker, Tim Robinson, and their reply speaker will be James Penn. And they will be debating against team from Chile, on my left. The first speaker, Domingo Carbone. The second speaker, Paulina Valenzuela. Sorry, it wasn't a Suela, it's a Suela. And the third speaker, Valentina Salvatierra, with Paulina as the reply speaker. <laughs> Judging this debate is a very heavyweight panel indeed. Nine judges are looking me in the face as I attempt to go through the list of names. They come from all parts of the planet, but in the course of the last week, they have done a sterling job of judging these debates. And we welcome, I think for the first time on an international debate panel, a judge from Qatar itself. Those adjudicators are Joseph Agula from Uganda, Su <laughs> Sue Edwards from Qatar. <laughs> Kianat Fakton Pang from Thailand. <laughs> Sam Greenland from, well, he thinks Hong Kong. <laughs> Tong Meng from China. <laughs> Debbie Newman from England. Greg Polk from the USA. Simon Quinn from Australia. 
and Luk Bing Fat from Singapore. Now you want to know what they are debating, don't you? The motion before the House, that this House believes countries should not punish people who pay bribes to officials of other countries. And to open the debate, I call upon the first speaker for the proposition, James Penn. In 2003, the UK Serious Fraud Office started an investigation into the allegations of bribes paid by British Aerospace, BAE, to the Saudi royal family. And these allegations were in exchange, uh, were, were the, the bribes were paid in exchange for arms deals that went on to be Britain's largest ever export. In 2006, this inquest was abolished by the British government. And here on Team New Zealand today, we think this was for some very good reasons. We think that if the inquest had gone ahead and that the bribes were, um, were found to be true, then we think that this would have had very big negative effects um, on, the, on the foreign relationship with um, the Saudi government, uh, the Saudi royal family. Um, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm also going to be talking about how when you start to punish individuals who pay bribes to officials of other countries, you get what is called cultural imperialism. And then, and then Nick's going to come out in a second and talk about the certain economic harms that come about when countries start to punish their own citizens for paying bribes to um, officials of other countries. Now here on side proposition, we think it's important to define this mood. And we define it to mean that... Um, in, in terms of the U, taking the UK example, that any citizen of Britain would not be prosecuted by the British government for, for bribing government officials of other countries. We think that um, we would suggest this in Britain. We think we would also suggest other governments all around the world to take up this, um, this, this, uh, different, this model and to start um, and, and would not prosecute their citizens for this sort of thing either. So on to my first substantive about the impact it would have on foreign policy. Now if a government starts getting involved in hindering deals between companies and countries by punishing the company, it has effects on the other side of the deal, on the country. And we see this to, um, we, we see this to have the effect that the country starts to get annoyed with the other country for doing this and for implementing these punishments. And this ruins the deals and the, and the country doesn't isn't um, in favour of this, obviously, because they're not getting their side of the bargain, they're not getting um, the deal that they wanted. So what we see for, as a result of this is that we start to get um, hindrances to foreign relations between the governments. And we see this, we see an example of this in the case of, um, of the Saudi government and the BAE example. And as um, what happened was the, the deal is called Al Yamama. Uh, weapons deals, they began in the 1985s, they went right through to the present day, they're still ongoing, and we, um, in, in, these, in the first 20 years, these deals were worth uh, 43 milli, uh, billion pounds. These were massive deals to Britain, but they were also massive deals to the Saudi royal family. And, and another deal um, for another further 40 million um, pounds worth of deals was, um, had been agreed on. Now, we see that when um, the government started this inquest into these bribes, and they started to investigate into these allegations of the bribes. The Saudi government, uh, the Saudi royal family, didn't like this, and they responded by um, threatening to cut six billion pounds worth of deals for Euro space fighters. But more importantly, they started to respond by threatening to cut all um, all sharing of. Uh, terrorist intelligence that they had. And we see that this sort of thing to be, would be um, replicated in many other deals if the individuals were punished. And we see that foreign relations in many other areas around the world would be, um, 
would be hindered by punishing individuals of your own country um, for paying Sir? bribes to officials of other countries. Wouldn't you agree? By this excuse of happiness, would you actually go against the law? Would you actually break it for being in happiness with this other country? I get your point. No, well, we think, firstly, we think the law shouldn't be there. That's what we're standing up here debating today. But moreover, we think that um, the law shouldn't be there because, information. because we think these foreign relations take precedent over the bribes. And we don't think the bribes actually do the huge amount of harm that we've heard uh, that, that, they, that they're probably going to come up here and start arguing today. Now, we, we think that um, the, British, the British government took very good steps in, um, in terms of uh, cutting these inquests, and we think that it was an effective way to do things because they weighed up that the cost to, their, um, sh to the sharing of terrorist intelligence um, would be far greater Point than the benefits that they would actually get by punishing Point these of information. individuals. Now, we also think that um, the British government... Uh, we're, we're able to look at the harms versus the benefits and they're able to weigh these up and they're able to see that the foreign relations and the sharing of, um, of terrorist and, uh, intelligence was very, was, should take precedent and was more important to society and to the country. Point of information, man. Wouldn't you agree? No, I wouldn't agree. Uh, so what you're saying is that corruption is actually not bad enough. I'm understanding your point. Uh, no, we think corruption isn't necessarily a great thing, but we don't think it's really a bad thing either. And we think that foreign relations obviously have to take precedent, and we think that foreign relations in these sort of instances are more important. We think that um, intelligence on uh, terrorist actions um, that, the Saudi government, that the Saudi royal family have are more important to Britain in this case than, the, uh, than punishing the individuals who... Um, did these deals, and we see that these foreign relations would be hindered, and many other deals that would be cancelled as a result of um, punishing other, punishing individuals for paying bribes to officials of other co and other countries. So now on to my second substantive about the cultural imperialism that is demonstrated when a country starts to um, punish individuals who pay bribes to officials of other countries. Now what this means is that a country starts to impose their values and their policies on other countries just because their citizens are doing something in those countries. We don't think that the, the British government wouldn't punish an individual if they went over to Holland and smoked some marijuana because it's legal over there. We think these values should be replicated in terms of paying bribes because when it happens in another other country, it isn't the Brit, it isn't the um, the, the British responsibility, and we think that the British don't have a place in imposing their policies, their values, and their laws on this country. Sir? Now, we think that these, that these, um, that, that these cultural values are very important to countries because they have historical um, presence and they have real historical and cultural um, standing in these countries. Over centuries, these traditions have been built up. Some countries um, might see these, might might see things such as um, taking gifts, uh, allowing a, 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 an official to stay at your very nice house for the Point weekend. Point of um, You're out of order. Um, we think that these would, we, we think that these values and traditions are very important to a country. And once the country that's punishing the individuals starts to impose these, we think that's morally wrong. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'd see this in the example like Bakshish in the Middle um, East and South Asia. It encompasses charity, tipping, and payments to um, receive favours and deals um, with officials and with uh, executives of companies and the like. Now, some nations would see this as bribery, but we think this Bakshish um, tradition is very important to the country, and we don't think that other governments have a um, place in imposing their laws and religion on these countries. So ladies and gentlemen, because we think that punishing individuals who pay bribes to officials of other countries is a demonstration of cultural imperialism, because we think it hinders foreign relationships, and, we think, and because we think it has economic harms, we proudly beg to propose. I thank the first speaker for the proposition. I now call on the first speaker for the opposition, Domingo Carboni.
Ladies and gentlemen, what is the real problem today? What are we debating here? We are debating bri bribery. Bribery is a harm that we, as an opposition team, firmly believe we cannot allow. It has consequences that are both harmful and self-perpetuating, and that, as they harm us, must be stopped. The proposition team, uh, team came here today with interesting notions, such as culture, such as traditions, such as religion, as of why some cultures may allow this bribery. Thing is, those are not really reasons of why bribery is there. Those are occasions for bribery to happen. The thing is, the only reason bribery exists is because people are willing to pay. And that is why we firmly believe that throughout the world, there should be an agreement on no more bribery. How do we plan to do this? We plan a slight change to the statu quo. We plan a legal tool with international standards, standards approved by everyone, so that there won't be any problem of what should, one, be On that point, sir. No, thank you. What should, one, be considered as bribe to come to an agreement, and two, the due process of trial of the person prosecuted. We think that these people should be trialed in their own nation. But, sir... If not trialed in the nation where they committed the crime. Not right now. Thank you very much. For arguments on an outline, what I'll do today is first rebut most of the arguments of the opposition side, and then give our first two arguments as an proposition side, which are, first, that there, the, the reasons punishing um, corruption at home and not el elsewhere are only right to be applied, and that two, economic and social consequences cannot be continued. Not right now, thank you very much. The third argument and the fourth argument will be done by our second speaker, Paulina, which are that, uh, uh, first, corruption buys political power elsewhere, something that is not something we should have, we should stay between our own boundaries, and that two, it actually works. It is a current solution that will be applied, and actually, it is happening right now. Onto my first oh, my first substantive point will be um, rebuttal. The, the proposition came to you today with the notion of foreign relationships, of being friends with the people around us. Point of information, sir. Not right now, thank you very much. Corruption isn't a great thing, they agreed. They do recognize, they recognize a problem in corruption, and we want to point that to the entire audience. There is a problem, and the proposition knows that. They know it, and they accept it. But they think intelligence, and that was most of their first speech, is more important. We do not think so. And we will prove to you today that that is wrong with the reasons that we consider the rebuttal. Not right now. Now, concerning foreign relations, there is such a thing as sovereignty. I am onto my boundaries. The reasons why I am a Chilean is because I am from my country and I should stay in that country. Any power I might have on there that point, on sir. a political level should stay in that country. If I have no nationality whatsoever in another country, I should not be able to apply it. And that is exactly the point that Paulina will prove in our second speech. Bribes come from another country. They do not come from the country itself, and thus they should be punished where they come from. Why is this right? This is right because we, as, a, as an opposition team, team, stand for the extraterritoriality of sir. law. We mean that th this crime is actually happening in two places at the same time. The place where it's coming from, of course, the country of origin, which in most cases in this kind of debate, we're talking about countries with a lot of money, a lot of resources, and the country where it is happening. Countries that are extremely poor. But a point that will continue on on our debate. Yes? So, is it really worth imposing our values when this could lose us valuable intel on terrorists? We are not imposing anything here. That is why we have proposed an agreement. And intelligence, we believe, is not as important as the value of human lives. As we will go on to prove. On that point, now, right sir. Now, thank you very much. Crimes should be punished. And the thing is, when it comes to this kind of bribery, the, the, the person that is actually bribing is not the one that is punished in the country itself. What we mean is that bigger CEOs comfortably staying at a couch wherever, in New York, in maybe Boston, are actually sending people to work in places like New Guinea, in places where they don't have point, any real sir. power, but they are not going themselves. What they send are smaller executives. And if anyone gets punished, not right now, 
Thank you very much. It's them. It's those smaller executives. The real fish, the one that is really committing the crime, are them. And there are examples. Walmart, IBM, Siemens, Architect in China. That is from 2003 to 2008 are just some example of the 74% of cases of corruption where international trade and foreign businesses were involved on the nation. Sir. This is happening. It is a problem that is real and that should be stopped right now. Not right now, thank you very much. And then there's the economic and social problem. Bribery undermines nations economically throughout three points. First, the external problem. These people are discouraging competition for it creates an unlevel playing field with an unstable and unreliable yeah. situation, scaring foreigners' investors off. We mean that. Why would I even try to do my best in order to achieve some business in a country where anyone willing to pay a bribe will get the, pri the price instead of me? Or maybe I'll get the price here, and I've already started my investment, but then comes someone paying bribes that causes me to lose my money. I will not invest Sir. in that country, and in fact, they have not. That is why most countries with bribery are very poor. And that will be our last point today, also my last point in this speech. There is no incentive, and that is the second case, to improve our products, as really what models in, in now in this economy is actually paying the most price to the bribe. It's not about the people buying the best products or the best service. It's about me paying the best price to the best beer. And that is wrong. These are not services. This is just Sir. hurting consumers. And that is not right. Yes? What about the countries where bribery is actually part of cultural practice? Well, actually, there are no countries where bribery by itself is part of culture. What they say is gifting. And this particular example actually refers to China. And in China, the thing is, what you do is give out gifts, not bribes. Everyone can tell from a small gift to a, thousand, to a million so dollar bill. That is not the exact same team. Checks are not gifts. And I think people are smart enough to tell one from another. Internally, local and national businessmen are harmed. They have no access to the amount of money they need to do these graves, And thus, the internal economy of these countries is hurt. But I've told you about these poor countries. What poor countries are, I'm am I talking about? I'm talking about countries with the, la the, the highest rates of corruption all around the world, which are Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Myanmar, and Haiti. What do you see in these countries? Poorness. There is an economical consequence, and we believe we should not allow it to keep on. And so it is, ladies and gentlemen, that we, the opposition side, come to the end of our sp first speech. And because we've proven that this corruption is actually harmful, economically and socially, to the country it involves, because punishment is necessary, and because it is imperative to act now, we beg to oppose. I now call on the second speaker for the proposition team, Nicholas Orr. When punishing those who pay bribes to officials of other countries means imposing our own values on those other countries in what is called cultural imperialism. When it means ignoring all the huge importance of foreign policy to countries and the huge harms that can result as a res uh, from not having good foreign policies as James presented to you today. We say on side proposition we cannot sacrifice those things at the expense of dealing with some individual cases of corruption. I've got two substantive points to present to you today, which are uh, the economic benefits of keeping of what our proposition put forward, and also the importance of the effect on public servants of poor countries. But first, I'm going to deal with some of the major problems in the uh, side opposition's case. Because they've come up here today and put one major, uh, they've come up with one basic counter model, one which has a major sir. flaw in it. And we have told you that international standards cannot be agreed on.
because everyone in the world has different cultural uh, values and different cultural and legal policies. Point of information, sir? Now, when they come up and say that we're going to agree on some sort of international standards, considering that James spent most of his speech dealing with this, telling you how we can't uh, come up with these sorts of um, integrating policies, we see that this cannot possibly work on what our side opposition have said. Um, also, they've put forward this, the, part of their um, sort of counter model type thing was this idea that get, uh, gifts can not, don't, aren't included as bribes. And we say that this is just like evidentially wrong because uh, gifts are considered bribes in many countries. Look at the USA and New Zealand where gifts to political parties um, are Sir? just straight, uh, illeg straight illegal. Now, um, because we've already shown you the cultural, the, how we must respect cultural differences, and because we must, there are cultural differences that exist between societies, we say, and we can't undermine the sovereignty of countries, we say that we won't stand for cultural imperialism. However, I'm going to move on to some of these things Point of that they've said about the problems with corruption. So even if this sort of counter model would work, there are some major um, things that I need to address. And they've come up here and said that we can't use do corruption. We, can't, we need to prevent corruption because sure. it's unfair. But we say that it's going to be unfair simply to, um, call, to bring about this, uh, but to, stop, to start making these bans because cultural, uh, uh, cultural differences exist. And different perceptions Point are institutionalized sir. in different countries. And they have different perceptions of what corruption means. And we showed you the Bel Bel Belkish example. Point of information, and since there's sir? no universal standard by which we can uh, evaluate the legality of all actions, it would be unfair to impose on individuals things which are considered culturally practicable in information. different countries. And perhaps to illustrate this best, just imagine citizens of other countries coming to your own country, engaging in institutionalized practices, and then being prosecuted at home. First and foremost, you would consider this morally wrong. Point of information, because, sir. And so the fairness issue falls to our side of the house. But secondly, the fact that this industry would be destroyed in your own, I'll, I'll take you in a moment. This industry would be destroyed in your own country would cause a lot of anger and economic harms, as I'll go on to show and also more severe things, such as the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia example. Yes, I'll take it now. So, bribery is illegal almost everywhere in the world. The problem is it's not being enforced. Law is not being enforced. What would you answer to this? You're saying that bribery is not, bribery is illegal. And bribery it's is not illegal almost everywhere around the world. The problem is enforcement, sir. Well, we're saying that we're gonna keep like some, we agree that corruption is bad, but we say that sometimes things like foreign policy um, mean that we must um, keep this, these things going. Something, and cultural imposition means that we must keep these things going. So we think that this is clearly wrong. Now, they didn't address, or neither did they address what James provided about foreign policy, because we see that it's incredibly important to prevent sharing of terror information um, in the Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia example, because this is a huge uh, harm to the UK, which would result as a, as a direct example of this. But then I'm also going to move on to my substantive now, which is also the economic problems which would occur as a result of um, these for foreign policy changes. And, okay, so in terms of um, economic problems, the impacts on British jobs would be just tremendous if we... Um, Point of information. If we brought this into place, and industries would be destroyed. Because look at the facts: forty-three billion pounds of information, were, came in in the first twenty years um, from the from these uh, the BAE contract with Saudi, alleged BAE contract with Saudi Arabia, and it was their overall largest ever export for um, England. And so, look at the impacts on the masses, the masses of people. On a point of information, sir. In those jobs, I'll take you in a minute. Um, who are engaged in those jobs, we would just lose all these jobs for society and huge economic downturn. So we cannot allow this to happen. And that's why foreign policy must come first. Yes. You insist about country sovereignty and how we shouldn't disrespect it. However, 
corruption and bribery only undermines this sovereignty. Um, corruption is not undermining sovereignty because it's Corruption is not undermining sovereignty at all because we basically address this, ladies and gentlemen, because of the simple facts about uh, removing foreign policies and cultural imposition on these countries, which we cannot allow. So I'm going to move on also to this idea of the, um, uh, the impacts on these poor countries where um, public servants, their own, uh, yeah, basically about public servants, because in many countries, public ser in many poor countries in the world, public servants' only way of getting a real income is like through these bribes, because there is not enough money to help them. There is not enough money uh, provided from within their government to get them a good job. And so uh, we think that because they will only actually be able to continue to exist through the bribes which are um, brought in occasionally. And although there are some harms with these bribes, yes, we admit that, but the fact is that we would be destroying the jobs of all these public servants because otherwise they simply wouldn't be able to exist. And we say that is it better to have a government that is completely destroyed by, um, by removing all, all these... Uh, cross-country um, transactions, or is it better to um, is it better to have a, yeah a government which is destroyed by removing these cross-cultural transactions, or to have one which does accept a little bit of corruption but nevertheless um, keeps a firm government in place that can sort of keep a stable country going? And we believe that this is definitely true. So. Because of the terrible impacts of cultural imposition and the terrible impacts of fo foreign policy that this would result in, uh, the moot must stand today. I now call on the second speaker for the opposition, Paulina Valenzuela. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the proposition has come here with an interesting assertion. Corruption is not that bad. So what they're saying is that this problem is not bad enough as to handle it in an appropriate way. However, when Transparency International gives, us, uh, gives this report saying that out of 159 countries evaluated, 134 have serious corruption problems, we can say with certainty that there is a lot of harm. Corruption is a problem, and bribery is one of the main components of corruption. So the opposition here is standing for something that goes against this corruption, because and unlike what the, the proposition thinks, this is very bad for our world and it damages it. Today, I will present your case first by rebutting two main arguments given by the proposition. Cultural differences must be respected, country sovereignty, and then On by, rebuilding, point, by rebuilding the, the arguments given by Domingo about economic harm and the a crime is committed in two countries at a time. And then I will present you our last two arguments, that is, that corruption buys political power, and then that these laws actually work. First of all, cultural differences must be respected. Ladies and gentlemen, corruption everywhere in this world is illegal. Corruption Man. everywhere in this world is seen as something bad. What is different and what differs from country to country is how, what a bribe is considered. Because some people consider that a gift is a bribe and some people don't. Man. But we have already dealt with this problem by telling you that this law that we're proposing here, that we're saying that should be enforced, would define clearly what a bribe is so that these confusions won't be produced. So we don't understand what you're saying, but this thing of cultural differences. Every Man. culture in this world accepts that bribery and corruption is wrong. What the thing happens here is that individuals don't want to harm their own pockets. And we can start worrying about people's pockets here. Point of information, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, have you, ma'am, have you ever heard about the cultural practice of bakshish? What? 
Ma'am, have you ever heard of the cultural practice of backsheesh? It's what we brought up in our first speech. Cultural differences of countries, considering two small aspects, are not enough because there's no one who can. But ma'am, there's no one who can say that corruption is something good. There's no one who can say that undermining the authority of someone by paying him is good. So we don't think this is a valid argument. Now about country sovereignty. This, this uh, team is saying here that we would damage country sovereignty because of the extraterritoriality On of that this point, ma'am. However, the only thing that corruption and bribery does is undermining the sovereignty of a country b because it implies buying political power. And this will be further explained in one of my arguments. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that one country imposing their set of laws on another country's policies that are based on cultural values undermines sovereignty? Cultural values. So you're actually saying that a culture values corruption? A gift, sir, is not the same than a bribe. There is a lot of difference between me giving you a chocolate for your birthday or giving you a $25,000 uh, check because I want you to buy my, my, my business. I mean, nobody can be so naive as to believe that someone can confuse a gift by a, ch by a check. This is totally naive, and it's just justifying a problem that is serious. On that point, ma'am. No, thank you. Now, going to my arguments. First of all, Domingo told you about economic harms involved in bribery. Economic harms include that a country that has a lot of corruption and bribery is eliminating the, an, an, even compete, an even competition between different companies. When a company is more, uh, cares more and is putting more money into having better, better bribes and better products, then we have a problem. If I'm doing a, a great product, but other countries not buying it because my, comp my competitor is giving a bad product but a good bribe, then we have a problem. And this is economic harm. So what you're saying here is that we would eliminate commercial transactions between countries. No, we wouldn't. We would just be doing it much more fair. And thus, we would be helping the market. So what you're saying is not valid. We don't think it's valid. Because when an economic transaction is based in a market that is totally full of failures, it is not right. Now, about buying political power, how corruption and bribery undermine the sovereignty of a country. When, when a, of, an officer's main issue is to deal with the citizens' problems and solve them. However, when, he's more, when he cares more about his own pocket than about the worries of everyone else, we have a problem, don't we? Let me give you the example of Guinea. Exxon started investing in Guinea and... Uh, Point, ma'am. No, thank you. And giving to these... Uh, to the Guinea government money so as to be able to exploit the petroleum that was in the area. What happened? That this money was given to the, uh, as a bribe and not as a payment for the government. So the, the, the dictator of Guinea just put that money in his pocket. So while he's rich and has a lot of money, 70% of the Guinean population is under the line of poverty. Point this man. only harms Guinean economy and its credibility around the world and thus his sovereignty. A country is not ruling itself because in this case Exxon is ruling. Because the governor of Guinea wants to have his money, right? So he will only do what Exxon is telling him to do. This happens Man. in many cases. When you're receiving money from someone, you do as he tells you to do because you want to still receive that money. So you, the thing you're saying about sovereignty is not right because the extraterritoriality of this law is totally justified because when you're bribing someone else, you're damaging your own country and the, con and the crime, as Domingo told me, is not committed in just the country, uh, the country where you pay the bribe. It's committed in your own country because the intellectual planning of that crime was committed in your country and because the money comes from that country. And the proposition said this law is actually impossible to enforce, but this is not true. It is actually being enforced by the OECD treaty, by the foreign corrupt practice of the US. For example, in Germany it's being enforced and Siemens employees, thanks to this law, came forward to offer information about Siemens, ma uh, making able to prove that Siemens have 
uh, had uh, corrupted countries such as Nigeria, and now it's being fined by $306 million. So this, these laws actually, actually work. And why do they work, ladies and gentlemen? Why? Because people are worried about corruption. Because we don't want to have corrupt governments. Because we don't want that disadvantages of people to be uh, stepping over one another, not because of their capacities, but because of their uh, ability to pay a bigger bribe. We think that what the proposition is telling you here is totally immoral according to the values that we are trying to propose in a society. There's no culture that thinks that corruption is right. Thank you very much. I now call on the third speaker for the proposition team, Tim Robinson. Ladies and gentlemen, today the negative case has mainly been based on the whole idea between gifts and bribes. Ladies and gentlemen, we see that this isn't a big issue. As, look, she said $25,000 check versus a chocolate bar. What about a $25,000 check versus a $25,000 boat? Ladies and gentlemen, we see that gifts and bribes are essentially the same thing. And unless you're giving a gift, as she said, for someone's birthday, which generally isn't a bribe, it's generally a token gesture of friendship, ladies and gentlemen, we see that unless you're actually, we see that gifts can be done as bribes. And so we see that this is just a stupid point for them to be putting the crux of their case on, when really they could have been engaging with us on lovely ideas like foreign policy, which they have just completely missed. So ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'm going to have a look at the counter model, which doesn't really do much to solve our problems, and as well as the stuff that they are picking with us, the counter model was actually worse. Then I'm going to look On at that the point, fact, sir? No, thank you, ma'am. Then I'm going to look at the fact that, uh, the fact of imposing values and the whole sovereignty On issue. On that point, sir. And then I'm going to look at the restriction of business, ladies and gentlemen. So first of all, the counter model. Now we see that they have come up here saying that they wouldn't dream imposing legal power on a nation's sovereignty because this is what bribes do, ladies and gentlemen. Well, what about the fact that we have come up here today and we have said that New Zealand and the UK are allowed to pay, businesses are allowed to pay money to political parties. In the United States of America, only individuals can pay money to political parties. And in Belgium, not at all. So ladies and gentlemen, at some stage when they're making their big, happy international agreement, some country is going to be missing out. Ladies and gentlemen, there is going to be some countries that actually have to compromise. And we see that this is harming a nation's sovereignty, as it should be up to the individual nations to choose their bribery laws, ladies and gentlemen. On that point, sir? No, thank you, ma'am. They've also come out here today saying, talking about enforcement. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, enforcement isn't the issue here. We've tried to run this as as best as we can as a value debate, but we see that in their model, in any case, enforcement is still going to be a problem with their model. The fact is that there are different countries and there are different police forces, ladies and gentlemen, so either model, whoever's model is here, enforcement is going to be an issue and we accept that. And thirdly, they've come out saying hurting the poor. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, their counter model doesn't exactly do wonders for the poor either. The fact is, is that when countries pay, when, we pay, when they pay bribes, they're generally to poor countries, which are the ones who corruption is allowed, and they're generally to, sort of, generally to social servants, who usually get paid less anyway. So in a way, this is paying the social servants what their government cannot f afford. So we see that, it, and we see that this is pouring no point, money sir. into the poor country's economy, which is good for sir. the poor, because the rich people have to spend money on the economy, which eventually gets shared around through the great uh, rules of economy to on the that poor point, ladies sir? and gentlemen. And I'll take you on one. Actually, yes. Are you aware of the fact that most of the money actually doesn't get to the people but stays in the hands of a privileged few? Yes, ma'am, but the fact is, is the privileged few don't just sit there 
Just, don't just sit there on the side of the road holding their money and going, wow, look at all the money I've got, ladies and gentlemen. The rich people go out and they spend their money on things that the poor people have created. And therefore, what they spend it on, the values on that, that point, goes sir. up, then, the, then what the poorer people have created suddenly becomes a greater value. And it's suddenly the poor people get the money for this, ladies and gentlemen. It's just the way the economy works. It's the sharing of wealth, ladies and gentlemen. On so that point, sir. No, thank you, ma'am. So I'm just going to move on to this whole idea of them not respecting sovereignty at all. Now we see that this is such an important principle that it stands alone. It's the basis of all international law Sir? that even if something is wrong, even if in 90% of the countries in the world we think corruption is wrong, which is not the case ladies and gentlemen, but even if that was true, then what happens is we should still allow the few countries that choose not to, to not do because they are their own country, and they are allowed to make their own decisions and reach their own conclusions. It's the basis of all international law, ladies and gentlemen. And we see that if we start going and taking over this, ladies and gentlemen, we see that it hurts, all foreign, it hurts foreign relations. It's as we've used the whole Saudi Arabia example, if Britain was to investigate, then Saudi Arabia wouldn't provide intel on terrorist attacks. These terrorists could be attacking the British, could be attacking uh, the UK, ladies and gentlemen, and they would not know. It's because they are on their high horse, out and about, enforcing what they view to be corruption, ladies and gentlemen. And as we have said, and this links quite ne nicely into the whole cultural imperialism thing, in Middle Eastern and on South point, Asian sir. countries, they have a practice of bakshish, which is a cultural practice, ladies and gentlemen. It's charity, tipping, payments to receive certain favours, and we see that this would be viewed as bribery in Western countries, but the fact is, is it's simply part of the social that point, and sir? commercial life, and it's culturally expected. It's just how business operates in these countries, and it's not fair for us to go out there imposing culture and telling other countries how to deal, and in business, is unfair, it's their way of life. So, that point, gentlemen, sir. Actually, yes, ma'am. So, we have already told you that most countries do have corruption as something wrong and illegal. What, the only thing we're trying to do here is doing something that will be much easier yes, to enforce it. Point. What about the countries that do have bakshish as being legal? The fact is, is what some countries, and what we've said, I strongly doubt your statistics, because all countries have slightly different views on corruption. Now, I've already made this point, and it just shows that they haven't been listening to the case we have brought to them today, ladies and gentlemen. The fact is, is every country has got slightly different views on what corruption is or isn't. So if you go out there doing what they're doing, create an international agreement for this, ladies and gentlemen, we effectively see that what is going to happen is there are going to be countries that miss out, and this is when the cultural imperialism comes in, ma'am. So on to the next point about the whole restriction of business. And this is also why bribery doesn't harm business, contrary to popular belief over that side. Now we see that if we are to restrict a business by saying that when a business is overseas, they still have to adhere to our rules, to, our, to what we view as being uh, corruption or not, then this puts certain restrictions on them. Look, it means that, they, it means that uh, if they're in a country where others tip and buy gifts, and they walk up to someone's house with a bottle of wine or a $25,000 boat, but if they, whatever happens is if this is what's expected in culture and then they cannot do it because of us, then this makes it harder for them to make friends in the business industry. It makes it harder for them to adhere to their culture and to make it, to make their business. Because look, ladies and gentlemen, business is all about the little things. It's all about the little relations we have with people. It's about, yeah. I really like you, so I'm going to invest in your company. It's all about that, ladies and gentlemen. And we see if that these businesses are still restricted from laws, which are in our country, and even though in the other countries it's expected that they do that, ladies and gentlemen, then this can be taken as offensive and makes for certain difficult situations. Look, a great example is the environment. Look, the environment is something that most countries obviously find important. But we, they still allow businesses to go to China and to adhere to their environmental standards. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, is this is all about the sovereignty. We have to respect the decisions that China has made and the decisions that every individual country in in the world has made, ladies and gentlemen. And so we see that simply because of this principle of respecting sovereignty, because it is unfair to impose our cultural imperialism, and because our businesses, if they're going overseas, they need to be able to adhere to the rules of their country, to what is accepted of them, we see that this, then therefore countries should not punish those who pay bribes to officials of other countries. Thank you.